here and the light's not hitting me in the face because I was usually blinded. Now I, can, now I can really see if you guys are sleeping or goofing off back there. So I know, right? So welcome to BB450 slash 550. I'm very happy to have you here. Uh, my name is Kevin Ahern and I will be your instructor this term. And um, what you see on the um, uh, screen is a page that will you'll probably see a lot of during the term and uh, gets updated pretty regularly. Um, tell you a little bit about myself and tell you a little bit about the course and also maybe even learn a little bit about you. So um, a little warm in here. They're opening some doors so that hopefully we get some air in here which would be nice. Um, I've been teaching this course for, I don't know, seven or eight years um, and um, have gotten to be very fond of the course and very fond of the uh, number of students and the relationships I've had with students that have taken the course. I really um, am a person who likes that sort of personal connection. I like to uh, interact with you. I like to help you in any way that I can. I also like to see you, of course, be responsible and do what you can on your part, but I can assure you I will also do whatever I can on my part uh, to help you to uh, get on top of this subject. So it's a difficult subject. I know it's a subject that many of you have a lot of anxiety about and um, I feel bad about that to be honest with you because I think that it's a subject about which most students find that there really is a lot of really interesting stuff in it, but if you come in it kind of going, eh, you know, uh, that's kind of a, a barrier to learning, okay? So, um, Welcome. Um, so I want to do what I can to cut through that. I keep a lot of office hours and if you look at my schedule you'll see I don't even keep, I don't even list them. My policy is when I don't have another meeting scheduled, I'm generally in my office and you are welcome to come anytime. Okay? Now you might check to see if I have a meeting scheduled, I'm not going to be there obviously when you come by. But if you do that, I'm more than happy to meet with you, I'm more than happy to help you in any way that I can. That's part one of the things that I think is very important for me to do with you, okay? If you want to set a meeting with me where you want to be sure I'll be there, then of course you're always welcome to do that. Send me an email. I will be happy to schedule that with you uh, as well, okay? So it's important that I be available to you and it's important that I be helpful to you. If I'm not being available to you, if I'm not being helpful to you, then of course you need to let me know that, all right? Um, and we deal with that. Biochemistry is a subject that most students take not because they want to, but because they have to. I've got to have it for a biology degree. I've got to have it because I want to go to medical school. I've got to have it because I want to go to dental school. Okay? And so that's the way that many of you come into this class thinking. Okay? All right? And I will also tell you there are a lot of urban legends that are out there. I won't tell you that it's an easy course, but I will tell you that not all the urban legends are true, just as I'm sure you know, that not all the things that you read on the internet are true, okay? So um, as I get wind of those, I do uh, try to shoot them down. I'll tell you the one that got started last year was that the averages in this course are never above 50, you know? Well, A, if that were the case, okay, you can't flunk everybody, right? B, it's not the case. So in the entire time I've been teaching biochemistry, which goes back to 1995, I've actually had three exams where the average was lower than 60. Okay? Urban legends aren't always true. Right? So don't freak yourself out with what's basically a bunch of bullshit. That kind of loosened it up, right? Bullshit, right? I'll say it again. How about some bullshit, right? <laughs> You guys like bullshit? Let's talk about some bullshit today. Okay? So, anytime you have a question, please come see me. All right? That's, that's number one. If you don't want to come see me, you can email me. I don't care. It really doesn't matter. Before the first exam, I'll give you my cell phone number. You can call me. All right? I have no problem with that. You can call me. You can come see me. You can do whatever works for you. Because my job is to help you to learn biochemistry. Because biochemistry is going to be important for you in whatever you want to go and do. Medical schools, microbiology programs, dental schools, graduate schools, don't make biochemistry a requirement to be mean to you. They make biochemistry a requirement because it's going to be a very important part of your career. So it's important for you to get these things down that I'll be talking about today. 
and tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, okay? All right, so um, I videotape all my lectures. I uh, try to get the videos uh, posted within uh, a couple of, uh, certainly within a couple of days uh, of the video having been made, and they're available for streaming, and you don't even have to come to class. In my experience, and I have done the experiment to test it, those who come to class do better. I have some very solid data for that. But it's your tuition money. If you decide you want to roll the dice and take the chance that maybe you don't come to class and you do well, you can play that game. But I don't think you want to play that game with your career in general. I do reserve the right to give pop quizzes if it looks like, well, people are really not taking this seriously, okay? So pop quiz is a possibility. I don't do it to be mean, I do it to encourage you to participate and come and listen. The best way to use the videos are to supplement the lecture. I tend to talk fast, okay? You're already seeing I like to pace, you know? If you want to get a really humorous thing, watch my video and speed it up about three times and you'll see I'm playing tennis back and forth, right? Okay, so I pace, I will try to st slow down. If I get going too fast for you, all you have to do is say, hey Kevin, slow down. And by the way, I like to be called Kevin. Please don't call me Dr. Ahern, okay? I find that really is a very stuffy term and it gets between me and you. So please call me Kevin, all right? Okay, um, it's important for you to get on top of this stuff. And it is a subject that is uh, rapidly expanding. Our knowledge, at the molecular level of what is happening in cells is exploding. There is nothing in the, all of the sciences that is exciting right now as what's happening in biochemistry. That's absolutely true. We are in the middle of what's called the biological revolution. Now, biological revolution happened as a result of several things, the most recent of which was the ability to determine large quantities of, of genomic sequence information, okay? As a result of that, we have an incredible amount of information about cells. If you can't pick up a newspaper today and not see some exciting new biotechnology finding. What I hope you will get as a result of this course and BB451 is an understanding of the significance of some of these findings, and they are absolutely remarkable, okay? So I hoped that one of the things I leave you with is an interest and an enthusiasm for the subject, and I hope to dispel any fears that you have about the subject. Okay, I know I'm coming back to that, but that's what people have. Okay, if you need a tutor, if you need assistance, I'm happy to help you to get that. If you want to come see me, I'm happy to help you work with me. So whatever works for you, that's what I want to make sure that you do. I want you to play an active role in your own education. I'm not going to pound you on the head and put the information in. You're the one that's got to do that. Whatever way works for you works for me, short of looking at your neighbors. Uh, no. Okay. All right. We, are, we clear? All right. So um, first expectation I have of you, you will read the syllabus. Syllabus is required reading. You can download it. You will see a question on the first exam come straight from the syllabus. Okay. You are responsible for reading and knowing what's in the syllabus. Okay? That's given. Uh, all the videos this term I'll be using, I'm uploading to YouTube. YouTube videos are a little hard to download. Okay? If you're having some real issues and you really, really, really want to have a download, I will make some other options available to you. I also post my videos to iTunes U, and iTunes U videos are very easy to download. So if you're having trouble with YouTube videos, you can go to iTunes U and pull all of my videos down. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of them there right now already. Um, they, they're in a podcast format. Every time a new one's available, you get notice, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to have a downloadable version, iTunes U is probably the best way to go. OK, well, that's enough preliminaries. That's enough about me. I want to ask a little bit about you. So how many people are anxious for this term? Be honest. I'll cut all your arms off. Okay. All right. It's about an average. How many of you are looking forward to the term? Okay. Some of you are probably the same people, anxious and looking forward. Sometimes anxiety, actually, for people is adrenaline, you know? 
People that have to go on live television, they get that adrenaline rush, you know, and a lot of anxiety, but they go out and they do great stuff because that adrenaline makes them do great things. And adrenaline can do great things for you and it can do very bad things for you. Okay? We hope to make those things be good for you. Hopefully we reduce that adrenaline. All right? We get you into a place where you can be your best and do your best without having to be anxious about things that you have to do. Okay? All right. Um, what's the worst comment you heard about biochemistry before you took the class? Anybody? Yeah? I've heard that you Oh, yeah, yeah, boy. Yeah, that's, you know, you can't teach a class in the university without hearing that comment right there. He didn't say we had to have it, and then he said we had to have it. I can tell you right now, okay? I'll tell you what I tell everybody. I write at the end of every lecture I give, I write what are a series of what are called highlights. You see them up there, uh, highlights here. After class, there will be a link there, and it will be my summary of what I talked about today. I can assure you that I write my exams looking at the highlights. You're looking at the same thing I'm looking at when I'm writing the exams. Okay? So I hear that, but I hope, I certainly hope I'm not asking you something that I haven't talked about. I hope that that's an urban legend. Okay? Because it's my aim, I, I have no desire to be tricky, I have no desire to uh, be confusing to you in any way. I want to test your knowledge. You had a comment here, is that right? I force a bell curve? You only give like this many A's and Ah, A's. okay. I haven't heard that one, but okay. So the, quiet, the comment is that I force a bell curve. I force, you're only going to have 10% A's and you're going to have 20% B's and about the rest of you are going to get C's, D's, and F's, okay? I don't do that. I do not do it, okay? What you will see is that the bell curve creates itself. It, honest to God, does. I don't force it. I post at the end of every exam, I will post the distribution of the grades, and you will see that bell curve. And the only way that I would force that would be if I made those numbers up, which I don't. So, no. Um, I grade according to that distribution uh, of what's there. And I don't have a, the, the other part of that is I don't have a fixed number of A's, B's, C's, D's, or F's. So, good. Uh, I've heard that 451 is significant. He heard that 451 is significantly harder than 450. I would say if you ask the average student, the average student will say it is much less difficult than 450. Most people find 450, at least in my experience talking to them, most people find 450 to be more challenging. You'll find more math in 450, and it's because of that 450 has a recitation, and because it has a recitation, it has a recitation because of the math, there's no math in 451. So, most people find 451 actually to be easier in that sense. But I can't comment for everybody. You may have talked to somebody who thought that. Yeah. What else? Yeah, I Shannon. Heard if a, a cell phone goes off, you lose 10% of your grade. If a cell phone goes off, you lose 10% of your grade. Yeah, I've been known to get a little wild on cell phones, I suppose. <laughs> um, let me ask you guys. What do you think about cell phones going off in class? Irritating. Irritating. Yeah. Annoying. What else? Aggravating. So what would you do if a cell phone went off next to you? I'd want to throw it against the wall. <laughs> okay, I haven't done that. <laughs> she wants to throw it against the wall. I had a professor one time that did that. He had this <laughs> fake cell phone that he picks up, <laughs> okay, and he's got it. So he pulls it out of his pocket and he grabs the other student's phone and he throws it against the wall and everybody thinks he's thrown. <laughs> you know? Evil professor from hell. I'll tell you a really cool trick I heard a professor pull one time. He's working on a blackboard back, you know, you guys may not know it, but they used to write with chalk on blackboards, you know. <laughs> it's a long time ago. People used to write on chalk on blackboards. And so it's the first day of class, and so he's got a bunch of freshmen, and he's sitting there, and he's, got, he's writing up on the, the board. And what the freshmen don't know is that he's stuck into his pocket some candy canes that he has licked the color off of, so they look white, okay? And so he's getting up here and he's talking and he's doing this and he's putting his hands and so forth. And of course he reaches and he grabs one of the candy canes and nobody knows this. And a student asks him a question. He says, yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> you guys ever go teach high school or something? That'd be a really cool trick to do. I'm not sure how well it works at college, but it'd be a very cool trick to pull. We had a chem teacher that would fake a hand and stick it in liquid nitrogen and smash it with a hammer. Fake a hand, stick it in liquid nitrogen. See, there's, these, are, these are instructors from hell. I mean, I hope I'm not this bad, so <laughs> hopefully. 
The only thing I'll make you do is I'll make you sing, okay? So you have to sing. You will have to sing for your supper in this class, okay? All right. What else? What are the comments? This is as quiet as you guys are going to be all term. No other urban legends out there? You want to make one up? <laughs> How come nobody ever makes up an urban legend that says, oh, wow, that Ahern man, he's the greatest guy in the world? You never hear that one, you know? Never, ever happens. What is that? I should start that one. <laughs> Facebook group, you know? <laughs> Ahern is awesome. What's that? What are the differences between me and the other biochem teachers? We're That's a very good question. I'm much better looking than they are. <laughs> okay? Uh, you will have the same instructor. I teach both 450 and 451. Uh, if you take 450 next term, which I hope you're not planning to do, but if you take 450, usually those aren't done by choice. They, uh, then there's somebody else who teaches that. But I'm much better looking than he is. So. You think I'm joking? You say, he must really be ugly, huh? <laughs> what else? The more we talk like this, the less we have to talk about biochemistry. Is that that you guys are just ready to dive into biochemistry? Is that what it is? It's like a fly flying around, doesn't it? It's my heart. Pacemaker just going. Aah. Okay, you guys ready to dive into biochemistry? You'll regret saying that. Oh, there's a comment over here. There we go. What's the weirdest thing that's happened in your class? The weirdest thing that happened in my class. I can think of two things. Okay? Number one, uh, I remember being down here lecturing one day, and I hear this sort of shriek from the back. And the restroom down there has started leaking water, and there's this literally a wall of water that's moving down this way. It was not pretty. <laughs> The second one was a little bit more humorous, and it was on Halloween. Um, I had a couple of young men who decided they would disrupt the class. Okay? Well, I'm, I have been known to be the professor from hell if people, you know, disturb other people's learning, whether it's with cell phones or whatever. So I don't want to have students' learning get disrupted. So these two young men come in, and they dressed as really old guys. It's a beautiful costume. Okay? I'll give them credit. But in the middle of my class, they walk down, and they come trotting down. They're doing the whole thing, you know. And of course, every eye in the class is on these guys coming down here to come and sit down in the front row. And by the way, you're welcome to do that. Just don't disrupt the class. That's fine. Well, they made a big production of it, so it kind of irritated me. So I looked over at them, and I said, well, welcome. <laughs> I said, I'm very happy that you gentlemen are here. And because you gentlemen are here, I have an announcement to make. I'd like everybody to look at these two gentlemen. And because these two gentlemen are here, you guys are going to have a pop quiz today. Oh, did the attitude in the class turn bad? And it turned ugly. And these two guys are sitting here, and they are the focus of every eye on the room. <laughs> Needless to say, they got their butts out of here. So I said, after they left, of course, and here's your pop quiz. Please sign your name to the piece of paper and turn it in, <laughs> which meant that they got extra credit. Well, of course, everybody in the class was happy. These two yo-yos who were here got chased out, and I was happy because I don't like people disrupting my class. <laughs> okay. So those were the two weirdest things that have happened to me. I don't use Blackboard for this class. Blackboard is an absolute clutch. Okay? If you want to see a clinker, use Blackboard. I think the web is much more efficient and I can get things to you faster, easier, without problems by doing what I do. So no, I like HTML a lot. I can lecture from this. I can't lecture from Blackboard. I mean, I'm sorry. Unless you're brain dead. Yeah. So you'll post grades on here then? I will post distributions. I will not post your grades. You have to get your grades off of your exam. But I won't post your grade on, online. No, I won't. But, but you will see the distributions of grades, yes. Yeah. Because privacy issues, I can't, I can't post names and grades, obviously. Okay, other questions? Yeah? This is kind of a quick one. I'd seen where there was a new advanced light source going online at one of the research universities. Do you know if that's been in use long enough for any of that material to make it into the literature that we're going to be using? I am not even sure what you're talking about, so I guess the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to talk to me about it later, I'd be, I'd be curious to hear what it is. It was in popular science recently. Okay. News to me. News to me. 
to me, this is great because with the rear projection, like I said, I didn't used to be able to see, there would be a projector sitting right there, and it'd be, I'd just be blinded by the stuff here. So, yeah, comment back there. Okay, so, oh yeah, the, 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 thanks, for, thanks for bringing up the addition. So, no, that's not true. The, um, there was a little confusion. My syllabus originally said sixth edition. We actually used seventh edition. The question is, can I use sixth edition and get away with it? The answer is probably, yeah, you can, okay? So, things don't change that much from one edition to another. I can't assure the problems line up appropriately, but with your TAs and or me, we can help you to do that. So, uh, I think textbooks are an outrageously expensive item, and I don't like supporting uh, the textbook publishers, to be honest with you. Okay. So the online class is always behind the classroom class because in the, in the online class, they see a whole term's worth of lectures like today. And those lectures obviously aren't from this term, they're from a previous term. So they're using the textbook. You guys are the first ones to use seventh edition of the textbook. Okay. So that's what's up with that. I, my advice to students is wait on the textbook if you want. See if you even need it. Some people feel they don't even need it. Do All right. That's the online. Yeah. yeah. So the online is sixth. This 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 classroom version is seventh edition of the textbook. Okay. So um, I provide a lot of materials. I actually uh, am in the process, and I, I I'm not sure I'll ever do it for this class, but I'm in the process of actually writing my own textbook. I hired a student last year to create all the figures that I needed for a textbook. I will give away for my BB350 class. So I, the students had to pay 200 bucks for a ridiculous textbook for a for a uh, to a publisher. Okay, I really think that's outrageous. Okay, paper is not that expensive. I agree. Okay, it's not. So whatever I can do to work around that, I, I do try to do that. Okay, so as I say, I'm paid to bore people. Hopefully, you guys are still awake. We should get started. Let's do that. Okay. So. Um, I'm going to say a few things uh, in general about biochemistry here that I'm not going to hold you responsible for. And I will uh, tell you when I'm going to get going about something that you are responsible for. So just in general terms, and that you're not responsible for this, but in general terms, biochemistry is the science of the molecular basis of life. That's what biochemistry is. Okay. We don't think about that so much. We don't think about biochemistry as being that new. We think about biochemistry well, it was always around like anatomy or physiology or biology or chemistry or something, but it wasn't. Okay? The roots of biochemistry literally date to the 1930s. The modern roots of biochemistry date to the 1930s when a man named Schrodinger said for the first time that the basis, the, the basis of life is not cells, it's not tissues, it's not organs, the basis of life can be found in molecules. And it was that fundamentally different way of looking at things that got people trying to understand the molecular reactions, the molecular basis of life in cells. It led to the discovery of the structure of DNA, which is truly where the roots of the modern biological revolution can be traced. Everything that we have with respect to genomic sequence, to the, the topics of genomics, proteomics, all these various omics, all date to 1953, when Watson and Crick stole data from Ro Rosalind Franklin to show the structure of DNA. I've got a limerick I wrote about that. I'll show it, share it with you guys when we get to that point, okay? They, they stole They acknowledged they stole it. But the point is that because of a variety of things. We knew the structure of DNA. It was quite clear that the information that we needed to know to understand that molecular base of life came from that, as a result of that. Okay? Here's a figure. Maybe it's not. <laughs> okay. The tree of life. Okay? We think about three major branches in the, of the tree of life in this class, and we'll talk excuse me, mostly about bacteria and eukaryotic cells. Bacteria being grouped in the category we call prokaryotes, and the higher cells like people, plants, dogs, cats, fleas, okay? 
Multicellular organisms will all fit into eukaryotes. And some unicellular organisms like yeast will also fit into eukaryotes. All of the, of the prokaryotes are single-celled. They're not multi-celled organisms. So we'll see that that division between prokaryote and eukaryote is an important one. And we'll see that even though there are differences that are there at the molecular basis, they're not nearly as big as you would think they are. I'll give you an idea. Virtually every cell on the face of the Earth has a common set of pathways that are virtually identical. Okay? We burn glucose in the way, identically to the way that the E. coli bacteria in our gut burn glucose. We make proteins fundamentally the same way that the E. coli in our gut make proteins. Okay? The molecular foundations of life are remarkably similar. There are differences, and we'll talk about some of those differences. But the fundamentals are absolutely written in stone, as it were. Okay? And that's a really interesting thing. It's actually a good thing. One of the good things, it's a simplifying feature of biochemistry. Okay, they, we used to have a clock in here that you could see, but now I have my watch and what's on the screen. Okay, DNA. Memorize those structures for the first exam. Okay, it was a joke. All right. In general, I try to make, minimize the number of structures that you have to memorize. I will tell you every structure I expect you to memorize, and I think it's fairly small, okay? It's not a large number of structures you're going to memorize. I would much rather have you spend your time understanding concepts than memorizing structures. There are gonna be some structures that you will memorize, but not a lot, and I will always tell you what they are, okay? I can assure you that you will never have a structure that you have to memorize that I don't tell you about. Covalent bonds, you've had organic chemistry. Covalent bonds are fundamental to uh, the molecular basis of life, okay? Covalent bonds involve reasonably equal sharing of electrons. They're not like ionic bonds where one, like sodium, pretty much gives up its electron to chlorine to make sodium chloride, all right? Covalent bonds, there's a sharing, and though that sharing isn't always equal, and there are consequences of that, it's much more equal than what we have in an ionic bond where basically one atom gives up its electrons to another atom. Okay? Because of that unequal sharing of, of um, electrons, we see inequalities in terms of charge. Okay? So this is a prime example um, of that. All right? Nitrogen tends to hold electrons closer to itself than hydrogen does. So when nitrogen and hydrogen come together to make a covalent bond, the nitrogen ends up being slightly negative, and the hydrogen ends up being slightly positive. I know it's freshman chemistry, but I find that people in freshman chemistry, you know, didn't learn it. Was it your fault or was it the professor's fault? I think it's the damn professor's fault. Okay? We can stand around and bitch all we want about people not learning something, but if we don't ourselves make sure that learning things is critical to going forward, how can we complain? Okay? So one of the things I want us to all start on the same page about is something that I expect that we will all understand. That is that uneven sharing of electrons leads to partial charges. We will see this gives rise to what are called in biological molecules hydrogen bonds. And hydrogen bonds are remarkable things. You're going to hear hydrogen bonds over and over and over as we talk about structure this term because they're incredibly important and they're incredibly weak at the same time. And one of the reasons that they're important is because they are weak. If we compare the energy of a hydrogen bond to the energy of a covalent bond, there's no comparison. Hydrogen bonds are much weaker. That means it's much easier to break hydrogen bonds than it is to break covalent bonds. And you say, why is that good? And I say, well, the answer is partly on the screen. 
That's a base pair. A pairs with T. Everybody learned A pairs with T. In your basic biology classes, you learn that they have two hydrogen bonds. And if we have GC, we have three hydrogen bonds. And you can do the math and figure that three hydrogen bonds take more energy to break than two hydrogen bonds, right? But they're still relatively easy to break. Why is that important? Well, think about what a cell has to do. A cell has to replicate its DNA. A cell has to make RNA from DNA. And both of these processes, processes require pulling strands apart. Do you want to pull apart covalent bonds, or do you want to pull apart hydrogen bonds? Ah. But if they're so weak, then how do the strands stay together? There's safety in numbers, folks. There's safety in numbers. Okay, Millions of hydrogen bonds held together hold DNA in a double helix. We can take apart short stretches quite easily. But taking apart the entirety of a million base pair or a billion base pair chromosome takes an enormous amount of energy. Cells don't bother with that. So this weakness of a hydrogen bond, as we will see, is critical, not only for the structure of DNA, it's not just an, uh, an obscure thing, but we'll see it's important for the structure of proteins. And we'll see that hydrogen bonds help to stabilize the structure of proteins. And because they stabilize the structure of proteins and their weak forces, they can be fairly easily disrupted. Hey, that's kind of good. You know why that's good? Because we like to kill bacteria in our food. We can cook it and destroy the structure of the proteins in those bacteria and kill the bacteria. If those are covalent bonds that are holding those protein structures in place, folks, we couldn't kill bacteria. We probably wouldn't be here. Cooking provides enough energy to destroy the hydrogen bonds and the proteins so that those proteins don't function and we kill bacteria by cooking. We can kill bacteria by washing our hands with soap because we're doing the same thing. Those hydrogen bonds can get broken with the interactions that we're giving to them. We'll talk more about that. So there's a real beauty to hydrogen bonds. I want you to understand that. Okay? Now we can spend a lot of time talking about donors and acceptors and blah, blah, blah. Okay? To be honest with you, I don't think it tells you much. You can memorize that if you want to. I'm not going to ask you this. Okay? What I told you to start with was the most important thing. The most important thing was that there's uneven sharing of electrons. Nitrogen has a greater electronegativity. Remember electronegativity from freshman chemistry? Right? Greater electronegativity, stronger affinity for electrons. Nitrogen and oxygen have greater electronegativities than does hydrogen. Therefore, when oxygen or nitrogen is bonded to a hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen will be more slightly negative. That's that little delta sign that you see there. It means it's partial negative, not fully negative. And the hydrogen will be partially positive. Well, just like a full positive can be attracted to a full negative, so too can a partial positive be attracted to a partial negative. So can a partial negative repel a partial negative. All right? These are all important things to understand. Now, these types of structures that you see here, the N with an H, the O with an H, are very, very, very common things that we see in biological molecules, proteins, DNA, fats. Okay? There's our base pair. All right? Here's some examples. Again, don't memorize this. But you see examples of how, about how partial positives can interact with partial negatives. Look at the hydrogen on uh, the water partially attracted to the um, oxygen on the carbonyl group. Okay? Very, very important. Ebb. Hello there. What did I do? Well, shut up. 
Now, I can work on it. Oh, I see what happened. Oh, it's going to tear my favorite tie. Don't want to do that. Okay, now we're back. <laughs> there we go. All right. <laughs> you guys are hoping that everything doesn't work, so we call the day off, right? All right. Okay, so we're about at a point where we should start understanding material. So you're responsible from here forwards, okay? Here is um, a laser pointer that doesn't work. Okay, well, I guess it wasn't even worth all the effort. All right, hydrogen on water, partially positively charged. Oxygen on a carbonyl group, partially negatively charged. And yes, oxygen has a greater electronegativity than carbon does. They're attracted to each other. There's a force that holds them together. If we want to pull them apart, we have to provide energy to pull them apart. That's why we have to cook food. That's why we have to do whatever we do to break those types of bonds. These types of bonds are, are everywhere we find in proteins, OK? Carbonyl with water. We find water with an amine. Amino acids get their name by virtue of the fact they have amines in them, OK? Quite a variety of structures that we have that's there, OK? Well, briefly talk about Van der Waals interactions. And the main thing I want to talk about Van der Waals interactions is just related to this one figure right here. Van der Waals interactions tell us, okay, that if you try to put two nuclei too close together, they will fight it like crazy. There's an ideal distance. You put them too close together, and the energy that it takes to put them together goes to the power of 12 as a function of distance. You try decreasing that distance beyond this point at the bottom of this curve, and you see you, it ain't going to go. Atoms are just like relationships, right? You guys ever had the relationship, you know, and things are going really great? And then after a while, Van der Waals kicks in, folks, because what happens? I've got to have my space, right? I gotta have my space. And you can say, wow, Van der, Waals, Van der Waals interactions apply to relationships as you're crying your way home to mother or something, right? I gotta have my space. All right? Atoms have to have their space. If we try to put two atoms too close together, somebody's gonna go home crying to mother. Okay? It ain't gonna go. All right? So it's very important to remember that atoms have to have sufficient space. That drives everything that they do. Hydrogen bonds give water the really bizarre properties and the wonderful properties that water does. Okay? We think of water and we just think, oh, it's a liquid. All right? That liquid has zillions of hydrogen bonds that allow it to be a liquid at room temperature. Water has an atomic weight of 18. It's liquid at room temperature, OK? Methane has a molecular weight of 16. It doesn't have hydrogen bonds. It's a gas until way below zero. Carbon dioxide has a molecular weight of 44, greater than that of water. It's a gas at room temperature because it doesn't have hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are a glue. Oh, please. Not a good way to get started. OK. The, they're a glue that literally holds things together, right? That's important, very, very important. Hydrogen bonds give water the property that's necessary for life on Earth. How about other effects? Well, other effects are very important as well. What I've been talking about are hydrophilic things, things that like water, things that interact with water. To interact with water, things have to be either ionic or have some partial charges to them. Well, what about the things that don't have much ionic character and don't have much in the way of partial charges? OK? These guys are what we call hydrophobic. All right? Take oil, take water, shake them up. Shake them up. What happens when you shake up oil and water? 
it looks at first like they sort of mix, right? And you'll set it down on the table, and in a very short period of time, they separate. Do you know why they separate? They don't like each other, but there's a more important reason. Yes, sir? There's no hydrogen bonding, but there's, there's, a, there's another more important reason. Okay. Yes? When they aggregate into a larger single unit, they have less surface area for more volume. Ooh, ooh, I like this. This is good. Okay. Exactly what he said. When they separate, they have less surface area that's interacting between the two. When I have little droplets, I add up all those surface areas, there's a hell of a lot more interaction between the water and the droplet than there is when they separate. Then we've only got that immediate interface that's there. And if you add up those, those um, surface interactions, they're way greater when we have little droplets than when, we, when the layers separate. Okay? That's kind of cool. Okay. These things all give rise to something we'll spend a couple of lectures talking about, and that's an absolutely phenomenal process called protein folding. Protein folding, as we shall see, arises from a variety of chemical interactions that include hydrogen bonds. They include ionic bonds. No, you don't need to write that down right now because we'll talk about them later. They include hydrophobic interactions. They include metals in some cases. They actually, even in a few cases, include covalent bonds as well. Now that's important, excuse me, because structure is essential for function. All right? You know that. Somebody takes your bicycle wheel off, you don't have the structure, the bicycle isn't going to function, right? Okay? It's important to recognize that structure is necessary for function. If we disturb the structure of a protein, we disturb the function of a protein, and hey, that's what we talked about when we're cooking bacteria to destroy their protein structure and destroy the protein function. Things that disturb protein structure interfere with the ability of the protein to perform its natural function. We'll talk a lot about that as we get talking about proteins. All right, now let's see where am I. I've got about seven minutes left. We can actually talk very briefly about what I'll spend an entire period talking next time, and that's pH and solutions. All right. Now one of the places where your chemistry teachers didn't give you your money's worth in chemistry was teaching you about pH and solutions. So I'm going to spend some time getting, hopefully, everybody up to speed regarding pH and solutions. pH, oh yeah, it's a measure of how strong an acid is, right? Right? Okay. pH is a measure of the hydrogen ion concentration. Measure of the hydrogen ion concentration. pH, you probably remember, is defined as the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. But in order for you to understand that, you have to understand what it means. What is the hydrogen ion concentration? Concentration is measured in moles per liter. And here's where 50% of you in the class, to my surprise, will not recognize the difference between that and moles. Right? And I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm not saying it's my fault. But I'm saying somewhere along the line, you didn't get that hammered into your heads. Concentration is moles per liter. Remember that. Moles is a quantity. And you can say, okay, I'll, mem I'll memorize this, but it has to have, be meaningful to you. All right? So the way I say it meaningful, well, what's the difference between I'm going 60 miles an hour and I go 60 miles? Big difference, right? If I go 60 miles an hour for a while, and then I go 40 miles an hour for a while, and then I go 30 miles for an hour, did I go 130 miles an hour? Of course not. If I know how many hours I traveled each one, I can determine how far I went, right? Isn't that just like concentration? If I know how many liters of a solution I have that's one mole per liter, I know how many moles I've got because I can multiply pretty well, right? Or if I know I've got six moles and somebody put it into 113.4 liters, I could calculate the concentration by taking the moles divided by the liters. All right? Don't confuse those two. You're going to do it. All right? You're going to do it. If you're having problems with concentration, I know many of you will, come see me. I'll be happy to talk you through it. All right? 
That's something your freshman chemistry teacher should have pounded into your head, didn't. You should go back and pound on your freshman chemistry teacher's head. <laughs> Why did you give me that grade? No, you won't go do that. I know that. <laughs> All right. POH is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. It means if I know the hydrogen ion concentration, I take the negative log of it. Bang. POH. What is POH? All right. It sounds kind of like pissed off or something, doesn't it? POH. I'm POH today, right? <laughs> POH is the negative log of the hydroxide ion concentration. It follows. If pH is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration, pH is the negative log of the hydroxide ion concentration. OK? Same thing. Now, there's a relationship that pops up. You learn this in freshman chemistry. It's very useful. And that is the pOH plus the pH of a solution always equals 14. If the pH of a solution is 6, its pOH is 8. So a solution that has a pOH of 8 is equivalent to a solution that has a pH of 6. They're the same thing. Okay. Now, one of the things, and this is where I'm going to finish today, one of the things that your freshman chemistry class didn't teach you very well was they taught you reasonably well about strong acids. I've got a one molar solution of HCl. Okay. If I have a one molar solution of HCl, it means I've got one mole per liter of HCl, and when I put HCl in solution, it completely dissociates. It comes apart. It means I have one mole of hydrogen ions and one mole of chloride ions, and I have zero moles left of HCl because they've completely come apart. It's a strong acid. Strong acids, you're going to hear me say this over and over until you get nauseous, strong acids completely dissociate in water. I put HCl in water, I end up with completely H plus and completely Cl minus. Not all acids behave that way, meaning that not all acids are strong acids. OK? Well, what happens if it doesn't completely behave that way? Well, here's a weak acid we'll talk a lot about, acetic acid. OK, look at that, HAC goes to H plus plus AC minus. You say, well, look, it just did it. Not quite. I put a million molecules of HCl in solution. I get a million H pluses, and I get a million Cl minuses. OK? If I put a million HACs into solution, I'll be lucky to get 1,000 H pluses and 1,000 AC minuses, which means I have 999,000 molecules of HAC that didn't do anything. It's a weak acid. With weak acids, we have mixtures of dissociated and undissociated. The undissociated being the HAC, the dissociated being the H plus and the, C and the AC minus. Now, why do I tell you that? Is it to give you something to, oh my god, I've got something else I've got to memorize? No. Most acids that are in our body are weak acids, folks. Most acids are very, very weak acids. Amino acids are weak acids. We'll see this. Proteins are full of weak acids. DNA is full of weak acids. Your cells are loaded with weak acids. We have to understand weak acids. Strong acids are very easy to understand. Weak acids we'll spend more time doing. That's a good place for